name is Adrian Tracy, I'm the CEO of ICG Medical and uh, welcome to The Voice of Nursing. Uh, today we are with a former editor of the Nursing Times, former CEO of the King's Fund, former CEO of the General Medical Council and current CEO of the NHS Confederation, uh, Neil Dixon. Welcome Neil. Pleasure. Uh, Neil, just to kick off with, maybe tell us a bit of background about yourself and a little bit more about the NHS Confederation. Well, I've been involved in healthcare for quite a long number of years. I started off working for what was then called Age Concern England, which was the precursor of Age UK, and worked for them before going on to edit originally a newspaper for physios and OTs, other uh, allied health professionals, called Therapy, which I think it no longer exists. And then from there I went to Nursing Times. Nursing Times in those days was very different from the publication it is now sold on newsstands so that was where the battle of nursing weeklies and there was one at the time between ourselves and nursing mirror and that was fought on newsstands so nurses would go to their local news agents or WH Smiths or whatever and get their copy of the nursing times or the nursing mirror whichever they was their choice sometimes buying both and it was a very different era because all jobs were really got through those two publications and they were the source of all news. Remember, you're not all pre-internet and access to reports, all that kind of stuff came through those journals. Now, it said in those days a lot of nurses started at the back of the journal, so they would look through the jobs and then turn to the stuff at the front. But it was a very exciting period. It was in the 1980s when I was involved in that. And that was an era, I think, when nursing was really starting to emerge quite strongly from the idea of subservience to medicine. It was also an era where feminism had started to really establish itself within um, Western society in a very significant way and so the role of women and the role of nursing kind of went together during that during that period and it was a very exciting period and really in in many ways quite an optimistic period it was a there was a feeling then that the profession was on the march and it was the beginnings of moves towards graduate nursing and the whole review of the way nurses were educated so it was a very exciting period um, and it was sadly a period when nursing Mirror, I'm glad to say it was them, not us, folded. We, we took them over and uh, had to close them down, formed something called Nursing Times and Nursing Mirror for a short period of time. Uh, but we were selling then, uh, it was well over 90,000 copies a week of a, a journal which was uh, up to 86 pages a week. Uh, so it was it was a major undertaking at that time, a really exciting, exciting uh, period. And then from then on I went on to the BBC mm -hmm. and served uh, there as uh, eventually was social affairs editor, mostly working on the Today programme and the 10 o'clock news uh, broadcast for a long period of time before moving to the King's Fund, as you say, and then on to the... Uh, the GMC and now to the NHS Confederation. Can you give us a bit of an overview about what the NHS Confederation covers and, and what your role is. Well, we are um, a single charity, but within that charity, we have a number of um, different networks and organisations. So we have we cover Wales and Northern Ireland, not Scotland, but the N NHS uh, Confederation in Wales and the NHS Confederation in Northern Ireland are both part of the wider NHS Confederation. And then within England we cover NHS clinical commissioners so those are the organizations which are responsible for in a sense buying or commissioning care throughout the English healthcare system. We're also responsible for the mental health network which brings together NHS and independent sector and social enterprises that are involved in, in mental health. And we uh, also have NHS partners which is um, representing those private sector organisations that provide NHS, NHS care. So between that and then we have individual members who are not members of a network but who are individual members and many of those are NHS trusts, both community trusts and, uh, and trusts who are providing acute care as well. So really across the, across the spectrum and I suppose the difference between us and many other organisations is we do try and look at the, the whole thing rather than at the individual parts and we're very keen to encourage a more joined up system 
in which the different parts work more effectively together because that actually has been a blight on our healthcare system and indeed many others for many, many years and we now have an opportunity I think really to help join things up. We've got divisions within our current healthcare system between primary care services and community services which again the public wouldn't even know what those two words meant uh, and why they were different but also divisions with social care as well and it is it is a tragedy that we haven't joined up all those different services and that we try and run them as sort of separate entities in fact having joint teams uh, where different professionals come together with nurses doctors pharmacists physios when they come together and work together and social work professionals as well they're much more likely to provide a joined up service mm -hmm. and frankly to the individual patient these divisions mean absolutely nothing what you need is the skilled professional who you need at that moment for a particular intervention but just as important an ability to coordinate your care and so that it is joined up and you're not left with one professional either coming in and doing exactly the same as the previous one has done or trying to take you in a different direction or finding that actually there's nobody so instead of having three people coming up your garden path then there's nobody very good and how do you you know from your point of view how, how do you see the sort of current nursing market and the nurses role well, I think the nurse's role has changed a great deal over the last, uh, over the last generation and, and it will continue to change. The boundaries between all these professions uh, are rightly fluid and I think that having professions that are too rigid in their view about what they do and don't do is not helpful. Um, and I think we have already seen considerable advances. So nurses are now doing lots of things that in the past only doctors would do uh, and I think it should change at the other end as well. There may be things that nurses are doing now that healthcare assistants can do under supervision and so on. So having a more flexible workforce going forward I think is going to be absolutely uh, critical. We have very significant shortages of nurses in a whole series of areas. In certain specialties we have real shortages, for example in uh, psychiatry and uh, mental health nurses. We have significant shortages in rural areas. We have had a very significant decline in the number of community nurses and district nurses over the last few years, which again uh, is largely driven by funding in that case, but there's also a question of trying to recruit people into some of these roles as well. And the suppression of nursing salaries over this period as indeed across the whole piece over the last few years has obviously made it more difficult to recruit and retain people into the profession and we, we've got to address that. The future lies uh, in nurses probably doing different things uh, as, as people's needs changing. Uh, it also means I think that as employers we have to be much more flexible and that aspect is a big part of the NHS Confederation is NHS employers who provide services for NHS employers ar uh, around the country and support them and are involved in the pay negotiations as well but I think we recognize as a confederation and as NHS employers that we need to develop more flexible approaches as employers if we are to recruit and retain the staff that we need and critical to that is the nursing workforce. I agree. Is it and is this week working with, is it Danny? Danny Mortimer, I believe, is it in NHS employers? Yes he is. About the ten step plan. Yes, well Danny Mortimer is my deputy as the in the Confederation and is the chief exec of NHS employers. Tell us a little bit about the ten step plan that the NHS Confederation are, are putting together uh, and the points that you've given to government. Well this is in response to the government's decision to put additional funding into the health service, which is very welcome. We've gone through, prob well, not probably, definitely the most difficult period in funding over the last nine or ten years. Since around 2009, it's been the most difficult set of funding settlements that the health service has had in the whole of its history. 
those years actually followed the best years in terms of funding. So the noughties, the 2000 to 2009 era, we saw extraordinary growth in funding, the largest growth the health service has ever seen. So we've gone from, uh, in a sense, from feast to famine. Now it looks as if we're reverting back to the mean where we used to be. And the health service survived. It didn't always thrive, but it survived until 2000, between 1948 and 2000, on around 3-3.5% in real terms on top of inflation every year. Now, of course, that varied. So some years we got more, some years we got less. And in a sense, that was part of the problem, that it uh, yo-yoed up and down a bit. So now we look ahead, we've got a major challenge in terms of the aging population. I mean, really significant. We talk a lot about this stuff, becomes a bit glib, but the reality is we're going to face something like a doubling of the number of people of over 85 over the next 10, 15 years. We're going to see a, a four million more people over 65. We're seeing really significant increases and many of those older people will, partly because of the success of the health and care system, uh, will be surviving longer but they'll also be surviving with long-term conditions and it's not usually one long-term condition. The big increase, something like 8% a year, growth in the number of people who have multiple long-term conditions and that's a huge challenge for our system going forward. So 3.4 percent may sound like a lot of money because it's new money on top of inflation but in reality the system will struggle with that amount of money to develop and change as it needs to do. But that is the challenge we've all got going forward. So what we've set out is a number of things that we think government needs to uh, needs to do and if, if people want to have a look at it, there are the detailed 10 points. I think the first point we make is we need to move towards much more patient-centered care. So we need to start designing services around the patient. Somebody once said, what's the difference between a laptop and an iPad. And an iPad has been designed based on what the user needs and a laptop is something that evolved out of a, out of a PC, an old style computer. We need to design services that are that way around, that actually say what is it that these patients need and want, as it were, what do they require to service their needs, rather than you know, what professionals have we got and able to do that. And I think developing those new types of service will be absolutely critical going forward. Another key point for us is workforce. We have a major shortage, not least in nursing, but also in medicine and in many other areas as well. Some of it rural, some of it based on specialty, uh, but and some of it just across the board where organisations are really struggling. And that can make the job harder for the individual. We've got to address that in a number of ways. First of all, increasing the number of staff who are trained and we traditionally as a country have relied too much on people coming from overseas. It's great and they have been the stalwarts, they have been really the foundation of the National Health Service. And we owe a great debt of gratitude to those who are here already and those who have you know, gone through and served the NHS over the last 70 years. But going forward we need a better balance and we need to train more of our own staff, some of whom will go overseas which is absolutely fine. People, professionals coming and going is, is a good thing because you can learn from other jurisdictions as well. But we need to train more of our own. Secondly, we need to look after our staff in a way that keeps them within, within the organisations in which they're working. And that will require probably a different approach from us as employers, and I think there's a recognition of that. The, the 21st century nurse has different aspirations, as does the 21st century doctor, physio, and everybody else. And I think as employers, we've got to adjust to create a more flexible means of supporting these individuals uh, so that they're able to do their jobs in the best possible way and that we get, uh, we get the right care for, for patients. And I think that is a challenge for us. And it is something I think that employers are increasingly becoming aware of, whether it's embracing technology so that rostering is done in a way that really suits the individual rather than something that the system imposes. And the irony is that if you do it that way around, it actually serves the organisation better as well. So it's finding new ways of being more flexible, more effective as an employer, I think is going to be absolutely critical. 
We believe mental health care, and I've mentioned that the mental health, uh, we have the mental health network within the Confederation. We believe mental health has been seriously neglected over too long, that we've regarded, we put physical health on a pedestal. And somehow, either because of a stigma or whatever reason, we haven't rated mental health in the same way. We still don't apply the the resources that are required and aspects of mental health remain a disgrace, not least children's mental health where we're putting nothing like the resources or the effort that we need to do. So over the next five to ten years we've got to start to turn this around. You won't do it in an instant. There are shortages of staff but I think the vision of what we're able to do and what mental health interventions can do right from the preventative end to those who are suffering serious mental illness, I think there's been a change in public opinion and I think the Mental Health Network has done quite a lot of work in order to be absolutely bring help bring that about. So that's another key area for us. Um, social care is absolutely critical. Social care has been underfunded actually long before 2009. It did not do as well during those early years of the century as the health service. It's consistently fallen behind. It's been subject to one set of cuts after another. We're now, the levels of unmet need are a disgrace and there are elderly people who aren't rich by any manner of means but who get caught up by the means test and get no help at all. And if you have no resources and social care, local government has to, uh, as it were, help you. The thresholds for getting help mean that you have to be in pretty dire need before you get any support at all. Now that's not effective, it's not the best way of doing things, it means that people end up in hospital when they don't need to be. They could have been supported more effectively in their own homes, so we're not preventing costs later on in the system and then once these people do end up in hospital, hospitals aren't able to discharge them because there aren't the places in the community uh, to do it because the funding is so poor. So the funding of social care and the way that we fund it really needs to be dealt with. Now the government has promised to do this but then the last government promised to do this and wait for it, the government before promised to do this. So we've been waiting for years for somebody to really tackle this problem. That it has now got to such a point where there is no alternative but to reform the system and do it quickly and so we're hoping that the Chancellor and the rest of the government will take some action on this. I agree. What, what effect do you think that has on the nursing community from a, you know, a morale point of view, from even a mental health point of view? You know, one of the people we work with is, is the Cavell Trust who looks after the nurses in hardship. Um, what sort of impact do you think that has on their, you know, their job, the morale, but also their ability to, to help patients? Well, I think the answer is that, of course, large numbers of nurses now work in social care uh, as well as the health service. So the profession straddles, straddles both those sectors and therefore is in a unique position, I think, to understand the pressures on, the pressures on both sides of that, that divide, which there shouldn't, shouldn't really be. Um, there's no doubt that when an individual finds themselves unable to provide the care and support that they want to, that puts personal stress on, on them and it can lead to people leaving the profession because they, they feel they can't do what they, what they were trained to do and that they want to do. And I think there's some evidence that people do get burnt out by systems being under, under terrible, terrible stress. I think probably at, at a sort of slightly less acute level you'll get individuals who just feel pretty frustrated with life and what they're able to do and again that is not that wears people down over over a period of time um, I think many nurses will see particularly those working in, you know in nursing homes and so on the the kind of stress that those institutions are under the levels of funding the difficulty the National Audit Office has made it absolutely clear the amount that local government is paying, you could argue is able to pay, simply does not enable you to provide good levels and appropriate levels of care in nursing or in residential care. So there are two very good examples of that. And then again, uh, I guess community nurses will see individuals who should be being given 
proper levels of social support which would help their health condition who are not getting it and that's incredibly frustrating uh, never mind the effect that it has on the patients themselves so I think this is this is a service under enormous strain and the irony is the future lies in putting more investment into new forms of community services which bring different professionals together rather than putting more money into hospitals per se. Now hospitals are under huge pressure at the moment but we have to try and find a way of relieving that pressure. If we simply put more money into hospitals then we'll be at exactly the same position that we are now in another five years time. We need to have the courage to put more money into those those services around hospitals in order to protect the hospital as it were to enable it to do better rather than necessarily pouring more and more money into the hospitals themselves. Now the incentive systems are wrong in order to be able to do that but increasingly leaders of hospitals themselves are saying as a director of nursing said to me quite recently in an A&E department listen Neil if there's any more money coming don't, bring, don't put it here put it into social care because that's where our problem lies mm -hmm. so I think understanding the importance of how the whole system is working is going to be critical going forward so you're looking to so you're saying looking to focus the funding into the social care element more preventative before they actually get to the chance to go to the hospital is a way to focus it to actually give us a solution so yeah. similar to an American model actually yes and it's not a it's not a pie I mean you know there's some aspects of prevention people think prevention is the answer for everything and so on the reality of course is if you take something like heart disease or cancer um, that's already beating in people's hearts and going around their bodies at the moment so the, this isn't about you know we can we can stop things happening and a lot of prevention doesn't save money so that's again the argument for prevention has been oh well, you can prevent lots of money uh, prevent lots of spending I mean the reality is smoking for example has been a fantastic public health success story it's probably the public health success story of the last 50, 60 years. Um, of course it's cost the health service huge sums of money. Why? Because those people aren't dead and by living longer of course they, they then have heart attacks, they then have strokes, they then have cancer, they then have long-term conditions of all sorts of things which cost the health service money. So stopping people from smoking was absolutely the right thing to do but the idea that somehow that would save the NHS money is, is fantasy so what we have to look at is in practical terms what we are not doing at the moment in prevention is preventing people for, for example people who have a lot of long-term conditions you can look at the sort of top four percent of users of hospital services and the proportion that they are using is really high so these individuals are going in and out of hospital all the time because they're not stabilized and they're not used so they're for example an elderly person who's constantly falling over and is not supporting their own home if you turn that around and say well instead of having that individual going to hospital which is not actually the best place for them anyway um, and then they can't get them out because there isn't anybody to look after them at home so then their muscles start to waste and everything else in hospital instead of doing all that what we need to do is put the right services in in the community which will it won't stop them ever being admitted to hospital but it will reduce the number of times that they are uh, thing, and that frees up the hospital to do its job better and to focus where it can do more good than it's currently doing so it's about that so prevention isn't necessarily right at the beginning of prevention there's great work that you can do with children and start and, and the obvious areas of obesity and around mental health there are interventions that help but we also need to do this sort of more secondary type of prevention where we're intervening to support people who may already have a condition but it's about helping them to manage independently in their own homes rather than allowing them to uh, deteriorate to such a point where they then need more care in hospitals. And I think it's interesting where you're, you're focusing on the efficiencies as you say if you can look after someone at home and make sure they're more independent you know you talk about the muscle wastage and what have you the elderly just keep having to come back and it's not their own fault you know if they're falling you know they just need that care as you say and that's a big thing you know and that's where I think healthcare assistants are having more of a prominent role especially in the community setting and actually looking after people 
and, and you're right, and it doesn't always require, and we shouldn't be defensive about this and say it, it always needs a nurse or it always needs a doctor and so on. We've got to be much more flexible about the way we do this and how we use people more flexibly to provide those the, the, the right support for that individual at the right time. And I think you're right about the, the, the prevention stuff and again around the elderly and there are examples from the states where um, healthcare companies will actually pay for um, some of the, uh, the the insurance company as it were will pay for the individual to go to a free uh, gym class or whatever just to keep themselves because if that builds up their their muscle des uh, their muscles and all the rest of it it will then save the healthcare company money in the longer term because they won't deteriorate um, and they do success visas now as well um, about a measurement about once uh, they've been discharged if they don't come back the insurance companies are paying out success fees as well to yeah. hospitals yeah it's a very slightly different model yeah it is it is and we haven't we absolutely haven't got our incentive system right uh, most of it is good intention then there's good intention to you know commission for innovation there are the payment by results system which essentially is a it's like a turnstile on the top of the hospitals so every patient who comes in clicks up and you get more money for the more patients you go in but of course, that's not what we want. We don't. We're not. The hospitals are not there to try and attract as many people as possible. They're there to treat the right people at the right time. And actually, we should be incentivizing people to stay in their own homes and to get get the support in in there. So we really need to think through some of the incentives that we put in place uh, in order to try and make the system work more more effectively than it does at the moment. Maybe just for our nurses, could you give us a bit more detail on that and how that might look in the future, possibly? Well, I think. Uh, it, Without going into the details of payment by results, which would yeah. send everybody to sleep, I think. Um, it's still there. Isn't <laughs> it? <laughs> um, I think the the key point is that we need to move on to probably long, less detailed contracts. So the contracting mechanism at the moment is too complicated and results in an awful lot of time spent on contracting and not a lot of time thinking about what the results of that, not a lot of monitoring of what, how those contracts actually work. So we need to have a new form of commissioning which uh, enables uh, joined up services to form more easily and to jointly fund health and care together so that teams are uh, are able to work together. Now all this kind of background stuff of how you create the financial incentives to do that um, may be invisible to a front frontline practitioner and they may not want to get involved in that but it is important that that structures around that enables that to happen and I think the current structures at the moment don't encourage they don't encourage general practice necessarily to work very closely with other parts of the system so again pioneer are absolutely doing this and federations of GPs are forming but we really need to bring these professionals together not for one to control the other but in order to provide joined up services so I think there's there are lots of exciting things going on I think the big challenge for us now is the, the tsunami of need that is about to hit us is going to be so great, will this just wash away all these kind of little innovations and so on are going on? And the challenge has to be we need to industrialize this in the sense that we need to repeat it all around the country and we need to do much more of it and we need to do it at pace and we need to do it at scale. I think that is the big challenge facing all of us as leaders but also the professions themselves and I think the other big point in our 10 point plan is probably the one that I would say is absolutely critical for almost all the others to work which is clinical engagement. If as, as the management class including nursing directors and medical directors and whatever, whatever. But if that class thinks that it can just do this thing and do it to the professions, none of this will work. These have to be, the ideas have to be owned by frontline professionals. The services have to be designed along with patients, but really thinking through how you, how you improve your practice, how you reflect on your practice and how you take that practice forward. And what you, if, if we simply concentrate on the incentive side and all that kind of stuff, you won't do it. You have to motivate. We're a people business. Unless we get staff, professional staff, 
staff who really feel and understand this is the service I'm providing, this is how I am joined up to the rest of the system, this is how I'm running a patient-centered service that really will make a difference to Mrs. X or Mr. Y. Uh, then it won't work and I think that's a huge challenge for us as employers and as leaders and as clinical leaders how we take that forward so that an, another, the next generation of professionals are much more involved in this joint enterprise than, than they used to be. Yeah, I think a great point about the you know the appreciation of what they're doing. You know, sometimes if you listen to what the front line are telling you, they tend to have the best, some of the best ideas because they're seeing the patients on a daily basis. They're seeing some of the challenges that they face, and only tiny little changes. You know, um, we've had Chris Pointon on the podcast, and Chris does the "Hello, My Name Is" campaign, yeah. um, which was the, about personal personal care and just introducing yourself. So tiny, small things that can make a massive difference. It is, and and what what was so clever about that? Uh, that campaign, uh, which was uh, led by his yeah, late wife, Kate, Kate Granger, Kate Granger well. yeah, um, who was an inspiring, an inspiring figure. What was interesting, actually, was not that her idea was new. I mean, I think we've been talking about this idea for years. I can remember going in with my daughter, who's now in her 30s, into a children's hospital, which will be nameless because it's all much better now, I'm sure, where the receptionist um, started calling me dad. And, and uh, my, my kind of 11-year-old was slightly, he was obviously, um, you know, could understand what was going on, just thought this was really weird. But this was an attempt to try and um, say, I, I'm, I'm the same as you. But, but of course it was completely the wrong yeah. approach because it, it just didn't understand. And this, um, I can, I can walk, remember going in my, our second child was born, going in late to the labour suite, rushing in, and uh, I, I almost turned around the spot because this, uh, the midwife was uh, calling my wife Liz. And my wife's known as Libby, her name is Elizabeth. But instead of doing the obvious thing, which is, hello, my name is, but it's also what you, you would like to be called and understanding that. Now, I remember nursing times, we ran a campaign on that years ago. And because especially during the 80s, there was a lot of discussion about the formality of, uh, of different professionals and how you would call Dr. X and I'm Dr. whatever, you know, and, and, and the formality of, of that. And, and it was beginning to be challenged at that time as in all sorts of ways people were starting to use first names and so on. But there was also then a tendency among some staff to call, for particularly elderly people who got quite irritated by it, to be called by their first name when nobody had called them. I remember an elderly woman saying to me years ago, this was age concern days, uh, saying, my husband didn't even call me by my first, first name, so why does this individual think that she always called me Mrs. Jones or whatever? It was obviously a term of affection, but, uh, and so, so it is about that thing, but isn't it so clever that they captured that uh, that whole issue in in one phrase, yeah, and and absolutely got home that that key point about how you relate to another individual, which is at the essence of what being a professional is about. It, it's not you're not inside their skin, but you're able to empathise and understand where they're at, and yet offer them objective professional advice and support and that that's the essence of doing it and if you start that on the wrong thing and if somebody calls you by a different name then you're immediately alienated because you are your name i mean that is it's the essence of who you are yeah. fantastic and they'll tell us a bit about outside of work what are you up to you yeah, weekends and so on i know you mentioned some children yeah. <laughs> uh, yes i have i have three grown-up children and i have two grandchildren who uh, yeah so uh spend a lot of time with them, a lot of support with them, and I, I play golf badly, and uh, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. So mostly family and friends, and obviously I'm interested in wider kind of political issues, uh, and I have another job uh, which I'm not paid for, which is chairman of Leeds Castle Foundation. Leeds Castle, for those who don't know, it is nowhere near Leeds. It's in Kent, and it's um, it's the most beautiful castle in the world. And to be chairman, it's an independent charity that runs it and so we are responsible for preserving the charity for posterity and for we have more than 600,000 visitors a year we run 
everything if you'd like to get married there free advert here okay. then, then we'll, we'll we, we, we do weddings and conferences we also do some medical stuff as well so there is a medical connection which is how I originally got involved with it and in fact this year we held what I regard as one of the most important things we've done um, we had the United Nations uh, led by uh, Dame Sally Davis is the chief medical officer uh, has uh, been instrumental globally in the fight against the misuse of antibiotics. If we lose that war, then we will see a return of all sorts of diseases that we had thought we had conquered. That they, It is one of the most serious hidden battles that's going on. And we hosted uh, a, an important summit of leaders across the world on how, how we're going to take forward this antimicrobial battle going forward and in particular how the world is going to decide the governance of this process in other words how, how are we going to organize our army uh, going forward and that report from the Leeds Castle Summit will go to UN later this year and I'm really proud that we were part of that uh, part of that process because it's not it isn't like Northern Ireland or whatever but my goodness it's very serious for us for our children for our grandchildren that we we preserve and protect the antibiotics that we've got and we don't misuse them um, and at the moment um, sadly that is happening within healthcare but also within veterinary medicine and a whole series of other areas as well and we really need to uh, fight that battle and fight that battle hard. I agree and I know we'll put it in the bio and I'll put it in the links about where we can find you I know you're on Twitter and then you've got NHS org I believe is there as well. So on Twitter at NHSC underscore Neil and via our website which is www.nhsconfed.org or our Twitter account is at NHSConfed. Fantastic. Neil, thank you so much for your time and uh, thank you to all our nurses and our healthcare assistants and all our medical professionals out there. Uh, we'll see you soon.